Good afternoon, hardware nerds, and welcome back to the Mile High City. We're here at Supercomputing at 2023. My name's Savannah Peterson, joined by my beautiful co-host, Lisa Martin. Lisa, Hi. it is such a joy to share the show Isn't with you. Isn't it a joy to share the show with you, too? Yeah, <laughs> I feel very lucky that we're getting to hear from the top minds in Supercomputing together. It's awesome. Yeah, and you know what? Your energy, the energy on the floor, it's all still up, just like our fabulous guests. Please welcome to the show Tommy from TAC and John Furrier, the yeah. <laughs> co-founder of the Cube and SiliconANGLE Media. I'm, I'm glad I could be here for this segment. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for me. too. <laughs> Welcome to your show. <laughs> really, really appreciate you showing up. Tommy, You, this, this has got to be a very exciting show for you. Yeah. You have one of the biggest, coolest booths on the floor. How's it been going so far? Ah, the show's been great. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, always entertaining to see all the community, uh, get to see face-to-face, -face, chat with all of our, my colleagues and everything around, uh, and get to see all the new faces, the new technologies, everything that's out there on the floor, it's pretty exciting. Uh, every year there's something new and I, I learn every every time and so, and my understanding is we had the largest attendance ever now for super Wow. They, uh, they surpassed even the four year ago one, this, that is what I heard. So, hey, yeah, that actually that just sounds gave me goosebumps yeah. for yeah. the four times so, I had, yeah, I yeah. saw over 10,000 So we're back people. to where we were uh, uh, several years ago and uh, yeah, but it's been exciting. So. It is exciting and speaking of exciting, you had two very big announcements I want to make sure that we unpack. Let's talk about Stampede first. Okay. Big new supercomputing yep. news for y'all. So Stampede 3 will be a follow-on to the history we've had with Stampede 1 and Stampede 2. Uh, our community still requires a lot of CPU computations, needs to be able Absolutely. to leverage the CPUs, and they haven't been able to take advantage of some of the GPU technology as of yet. And so mm -hmm. part of our strategy on Stampede 3 is to deploy an Intel-based system. We actually have other systems to support other type of research activities. And uh, with Stampede uh, 3, we're going to be deploying at least 560 new of the Intel Sapphire Rapids nodes. Woo. These are the Dell servers, four and two U, direct yep. liquid cooled. So all liquid cooling, uh, everything, 60 kilowatts per rack. So these are going to be a pretty dense solution. So we're pretty excited because the performance of the Sapphire Rapids has been great for our application space, especially those codes and applications that aren't suited for GPUs or, or accelerators as of yet. And so. that was all thanks to a $10 million award from the National Science That's Foundation, correct. correct? That's correct. That's a follow on. In fact, uh, the Stampede 1 and Stampede 3 two were both NSF awards, and Stampede 3 is the follow-on to, to those two awards, and uh, we're going to continue to build upon that I want millions of dollars in awards, <laughs> yeah. and I want to know a lot about the work you're doing yeah. there. Well, it does. Yeah. It yeah. all goes to hardware, uh, but we do get some funding to operate and maintain and, and support the system to the community and to the researchers that, that use it, so. But uh, yeah, it's exciting. It's, uh, it's many exciting. generations of, and you know, we're going to operate the system for five years, and it's going to have a, a pretty long life. And so, uh, we're we're excited about the what's going to offer, and we will have some of the new Intel Pontevecchio GPUs as kind of experimentation in that system as well. Yeah. So we'll have 80 new uh, Pontevecchio GPUs, similar to what's in Argon's uh, uh, yeah. Aurora system. Yeah. And, uh, and and again, we want to explore that space and see how well our users can leverage and, and utilize that technology. So you, you've given us a peek under the hood of some <laughs> exciting announcements. TAC, for anyone that doesn't know, is Texas Advanced Computing Center, uh, based out of UT Austin, I believe. Yeah, that's right. The University of Texas how, at Austin. How, so all of the all of the technology technological advancements that you are doing under the hood that you just kind of talked about. How does that? really drive the mission and the vision of TAC forward? So, so our mission really is to support scientific research at, at the University of Texas, in the state of Texas, and now with NSF funding across the entire country. So, and in fairness, across the entire world, you were mentioning that you were sending Happy, our last yeah, guest, servers down in South Africa. That's right, and so uh, uh, we have researchers that access our systems from pretty much around the world because they're collaborating with U.S. researchers and they're allowed to work with them and get access to our systems uh, and utilize them to do their research and support in support like Perfect example is the Large Hadron Collider. They do some processing on our systems like Frontera uh, and Stampede 2 currently. So and cool. so, yeah, so we're pretty excited about being able to do that uh, in the future, so. Tommy, we had you guys on theCUBE last year talking about the su support you guys had for national disasters, yep. COVID, oil spills, weather, a lot of high-end, high-performance high computing. This year, 
And we kind of saw the AI wave, but we didn't yeah, really drill yeah. into it last year no. hard enough. But this year, with the ecosystem growing, AI is the lift. Yeah. Um, you guys were at the Dell Community HPC event that was the pre-event for this event. You, you, were like, you actually got a call out from Armando <laughs> from Dell. You know, good, good, good customer, good for that, <laughs> good for Dell. But uh, you guys were talking about some, I want to call this out because we've been using it all week on the show. Um, Dan from TAC said, AI vindicates the HPC way, AI hardware will dominate, AI needs interconnects, yep. hyperscalers will dominate the trend. Yeah. Really kind of terse, but right on point, that's the market dynamics going on right now. So you have chips and cloud coming together. Right. That's changing the hardware and software market because the complexity of the workloads that AI is bringing is going to change the game. What's your reaction to that? Explain to our <laughs> audience why this is important and why this is an inflection point yeah. for HPC. Yeah, so you know, HPC over the years and the trends, you know, we used to build big iron systems and big giant, very complex kind of single purpose systems and you know it's interesting because then the x86 revolution came along the gamers all the desktops and everything and it's like HPC then realized that well that's a much bigger market than us and we need to leverage that technology to be able to do our science and support our researchers same things now, we see trend happening with AI. And in fact, we see them leveraging what we've already learned in HPC, and they're like, oh, we got to scale out, we got to scale big, we got to go to thousands and thousands of GPUs, and it's like, well, we need to have interconnects to be able to talk to these, they need high bandwidth, and so yeah, yeah it's things we've been doing for 30 years in, in HPC. And do, you feel, do you feel like everyone <laughs> is, is seeing you now? Like, is this almost a little <laughs> bit of the deep computing moment in the sun? I hope so, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't, not quite yet, uh, but I, I think it's coming. So. The thing is, that what I love about this, Savannah, we talked this on our opening a couple days ago, is that there's an exuberance and enthusiasm from the folks who have been doing it. Mm -hmm. In the AI world and HPC in particular, there's been grinding going on, years of grinding. We saw this in other markets like video, now it's exploding. Mm -hmm. The folks that have been doing the work for years, like, we've been doing HPC for years, mm -hmm. we've been doing it, and then, uh, well, but then it's going mainstream, so now you have other people. Well, and you don't even realize, I mean, how much HPC impacts your general daily life, and like how much is behind the scenes that companies are doing uh, to simulate and, and uh, you know, develop their products in, a, in you know, computational space. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the consumer doesn't necessarily see all of that activity, so it is good to see it broadening out, getting yeah. outside. You know, the university and academic DOE research community has been doing HPC for a long time, but now companies are le really leveraging it and, and deploying it. And with the GPU and the acceleration that you can get and the benefits that can get you at a lower power potentially yeah. to deliver more performance, yeah. that's really going to be a key aspect. And one thing I want to get your us. thoughts on, I, I love this because we've been talking also about the, how HPC has been about precision and scale, mm -hmm. but now with LLMs and models you can get broad <laughs> yeah. breadth and then depth and precision at the same right. time, which opens up personalization, you got pro productivity, and then the access that you mentioned earlier, all happening. So what is your, uh, how do you see the, that opening up from a user's perspective? <sighs> what kind of new access and, and enablement will you enable? Because right now it's the high end stuff. Okay, storms, right, natural disasters. Right. What are some of the things you might see pop out of the woodwork or use cases that we might not see now well, around the corner. What's going to be interesting from our point of view is you know, a lot of what we've supported in the past has been simulation and, and uh, you know, just being able to, to model uh, through equations what we think the physics of the world is and everything. What we're going to see with AI and everything is taking surrogate models, you know, smaller approaches where you can very quickly iterate and optimize to a specific answer and solution. Um, and then when you need to get real precision, you drill down on that answer and you've already been you know, part of the way there. I think we'll see a little bit of that. Yeah. Um, I have to admit in the research and academic space, we haven't seen uh, there's a lot of interest in AI and ML, but our challenge is we don't have the data sets that uh, you know people are doing image training, doing analysis, you know, uh, finding wolves in, in pictures and things like that, or doing traffic patterns. Yeah. Now with LLM and a lot of these and other synthetic uh, data, by yeah, the way, is, is hot. Uh, yeah, exactly. Generating synthetic data because you know the the challenge is, is to really get AI to work well. You got to have good clean data, yeah. and getting good clean data is a challenge. People aren't and talking about that enough. Yeah, yeah. Data hygiene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Data, data hygiene. Twenty yeah. year conversation. Just gotta wash yeah. up a little bit well, on and that then you data. You gotta front. keep it too because <laughs> if you're using this data to train your models and then the data changes, you need to retrain the models and you gotta. It's yeah, a yeah. whole adaptive technology that's really going to change how people 
perceive and, and, uh, and interact with the computers. And, and so it's going to be. It's going to change how we fundamentally ask questions yeah, around yeah. what's possible. I mean, you already see it now. I mean, all of the yeah. chat bots and all the stuff yeah. and yeah, of course, yeah. chat GPT and everything. It's, it, it, it really is going to be a game changer. And it's we hope to be on that forefront and support that activity. Uh, but again, it's it's a bit challenging to keep up with the technology. Well, you had, you had an announcement about this yep. this week too, right? We've got Vista. It's a yep. departure from your x86 yep. uh, based architecture, first system with an ARM processor. Tell us about it. Yeah, so um, so we like to have a whole ecosystem of platforms at TAC. So you know, we do have an Intel-based platform. We have an AMD pl platform. You play nice We've, with everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we like, to, all the big we like to joke we're an equal opportunity data center. We'll take whatever vendors <laughs> willing to give us. I like that. Um, and you know, we do explore a lot of new technologies. Try to evaluate what's going to be coming. And uh, um, because of that, you know, yeah. we know our users. You know, one type of system may not work well for them, so yeah. we want to offer options and, yeah. and variety. Yeah. And you know, AMD's got some good platforms, works really well on certain things, Intel's work on some things. NVIDIA GPUs are good for some. We have some MI uh, 250s, or yeah, 200s in SOT and at TAC that we've been tinkering with. Um, uh, but anyway, Vista, is following on to all that technology. So it'll be our very first large scale ARM system. Yeah, uh, which been, is cool. Which is interesting. The ARM ecosystem software we really yeah. see is finally getting yeah. to the point we can yeah. support scientific You can feel their presence as much yeah. bigger here on the well, show floor Well they got vectors, too. pieces, yeah. and, the, and the processors now. They got a lot of the things that HPC needs. Uh, you know, they've been low power for a long time and everything, but now we see with the yeah. Grace processor, uh, the number of cores and the performance it can provide is, is quite good. And like I said, a lot of our applications are still CPU oriented. Yep. So yeah. for Vista, we plan a pretty decent sized portion that will be uh, primarily CPU, so it'll be two socket grace uh, uh, nodes uh, over an NDR inter in interconnect from NVIDIA. Um, but also we're going to have 300 of the grace hopper nodes, and this yeah. is really Love me a the potential grace game nodes. changer <laughs> in terms of, of technology, having a single memory space with yeah. your grace processor and your, your yeah. hopper right there, and the amount of power you can get, uh, and the efficiency it could, could provide is, is really one one of the big aspects from us. So we expect a lot of our AI and ML workloads will start moving over to the Grace Hopper processor. But beyond that, we got a lot of scientific applications that we're already starting to port onto that platform. And we've been working very closely with the NVIDIA developers and teams to help us port and tune those applications onto getting their Getting those GPUs is like, like getting that gift you wanted. You know, it's like, it's the shiny toy you wanted. It's, it's a good toy to yeah. have. People well, want it. Well. And that brings, up, that brings up the power. And, and I got to ask you about the question that's been in the hallways here. Here is open, open, open converse, open connectivity, yeah. right. silicon diversity, and AI silicon platforms. You see chips. How important is open standards going to be for this? Because <sighs> you got, you're starting to see a lot of innovation and kind of people building stuff that's new yeah. on top of the pre-existing scale, especially we, inference, for example. Yeah, we are huge fans of open standards. In fact, almost all every piece of software that we develop or, or write at TAC, we make open. We provide to the community, we allow them to get the source code, we we understand that that's the one best way for us to advance everybody else. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. They don't have to you know it's figure so, it all out. And so, so yeah, yeah. We just so we're supportive of that community. We certainly encourage it. And the other thing is is we a lot of times when we work with other academics and other research organizations, they they you know we know we're leading the way. We realize that we're forging into the new technology, and they basically want to be able to reproduce what we did and not have to go through all the struggles. And it's like well we'll figure ourselves of this stuff out, we'll get it working, and then you can replicate and, and take what we've done and, and do it at your own side or, and, and use our software tools and or, you know, what's available in the open source community. So, yeah. um, big fans of that. I'd love to double click a little bit on the security issue and have you tell us how does tech balance the need for providing <sighs> that open access to competing resources with the security considerations, the privacy considerations that are associated with very likely sensitive research data. Yeah. Well, this, this is a huge challenge. Um, you know, I can make the absolute most secure system in the world, but it would not be usable for any researcher. Uh, and of course, if you have an insecure research system, it's going to get hacked into and all the researchers then won't be able to do their work anyway. So we have a delicate balance that we have to maintain. Uh, we certainly try to implement all the best security practices. Uh, all of our system are multi-factor authentication to get into. You're starting to see this pretty much banks, everywhere you go. You've got to have two-factor or some kind of multi-factor authentication. It's got to be something you know, like your password, and something you have, like a token or, or some kind of other, other thing. And, and uh, uh, that's how we've 
tried to address the security issue, but even so, you know, uh, we don't want to get in the way of the research, and so we don't want to put anything that's going to be secure and, and inhibit performance, like on our compute nodes or anything like that. We want them to get 100% best performance. So, so we have to kind of weigh, you know, deploying the systems, but ensuring that they are secure and making sure that you know the data doesn't get lost, doesn't get exfiltrated, um, and uh, you know, we don't. We only have a small enclave where we support protected data and HIPAA type things, okay. and so. That is expanding. We see that actually growing, and and uh, now you know more and more data is becoming protected and personalized, and so so we're we're moving into that realm. But it, it, I have to say, it's a bit challenging on the big HPC general purpose systems when you got thousands of users on there, ensuring data is not getting taken or, or stolen, and so it, it's it, it's tough. It's, it's a challenge. I would love to have nice open systems that users <laughs> could easily log into, transfer data in and out of, um, but immediately they'd get hacked into. To like next, yeah. and Bitcoin miners be running everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they they would. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it, it would be a free for all. So. Yeah. <laughs> How big of a magnet for recruitment is TAC for UT? It, it's a great magnet. I mean, it certainly is. Is we've been able to attract faculty and researchers to the campus and having these systems easily available uh, to to the campus. But even so, we don't allocate most of the time on the systems. The National Science Foundation has a committee that allocates the time and judges is the research that gets to run on. Oh, the I didn't so realize we did not that. Pick, we do not pick the users that run on our systems. Oh, interesting. So there's a whole committee that oh, does cool. that, and oh, so wow. they do the allocations. You really they, are equal opportunity. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's peer it's reviewed. Door. Yeah. yeah, well, it's, it's peer reviewed science. Again, yeah. you know, we want to make right, sure right. that the community is telling yeah. us who we need to support and who needs to run on our systems, and then we figure out how to make sure their applications work well in our environment. And uh, Tommy, can I ask a um, infrastructure setup question because mm -hmm. I think when I hear GPUs, I'm like, get as many as you uh. can, or <laughs> stockpile them. <laughs> yeah. And then you got to build around them. So one of the things that's the theme here is says, the, the hardware is changing, you're seeing dedicated AI clusters yeah. emerge, um, which is not a new th concept of having clusters, but they're dedicated to AI mm. with the GPUs. What are you building around it? What's your vision? How do you see that unfolding? <sighs> and then how does that change the tech stack? Now that you have foundational models and inference scaling out and training models being focus specifically yeah. on getting it up and running. Right. It sounds sounds like a sandbox and then <sighs> scale. This is, that... is, this is going to be one of our challenges moving forward because we want to make sure that we can leverage the hardware that's doing AI and ML, also to support HPC and research, uh, other research activities. So we're going to try to build our clusters in such a way that we can still do a lot of different things on it and not have just AI specialized, but you know, that's that we're going to have to have some dedicated resources to do <laughs> LLMs yeah. and some of these things so that they persist and that they're available and that, so we're going to have to explore that and so that's a new technology. the enthusiasm is high on AI. Uh, yeah. How, how are you seeing experimentation and workload, production workloads mm -hmm. migrating? How do, you, what, how do you see that evolving? Is it going faster than you thought? Is it slower? Are people taking their time? I you think in our iteration. community, unfortunately, it's going a little slower than it probably has. And again, it's, it's because a lot of our academic researchers need to get their research done. They have grants, they have deliverables, they need to get their science done, they want to get their papers out. They got a lot go of people watching. Right, and, yeah, and, and, funding. and so, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's hard because they can't go back and change that code that they've been using for years and years right. and to port it to another application, a new technology or new thing. So they want to make sure it's going to persist for a long time. And yeah. so, uh, uh, so, you know, we do see a lot of adoption of CUDA mm -hmm. um, and uh, cert certainly that's been great. I would say that in, from my mind, I'd like that to be a more open standard so that it would work across other technologies, yep. especially with a lot of these new accelerators coming yeah. along. It's going to be imperative. Yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah. it, we're we going to have to have silent, something. Like yeah, we, we, we've got we've to fix some kind of standard language so that users don't have to worry about all these different languages to yeah. support. So true. All right, final question for you, Tommy. I'm going to ask you to take your hat off, <laughs> your, your tack hat off, which might be a little tricky, but I'm curious, for you personally, I mean, you get to see so many cool research projects. <laughs> Do you have a favorite or a clutch? I mean, you don't have to say favorite because that term can be a little demoralizing to anyone who's not your favorite, but one that's really exciting you right now. So uh, so the one of the projects that I really, is kind of close to my heart at, at, that we support and run at, at TAC is, is uh, this hypersonics flow uh, algorithm that this, this one research group has been working on. My original background is aerospace engineering. I, I'm actually an aerospace I'm engineer. I'm a total AV nerd for the record, <laughs> so, so, so you're and, good. And, and, and I speci uh, specialized in computational fluid dynamics. So CFD has is, is been, uh, yeah, it's Okay, my, so this is all kind <laughs> of connecting the 
dots yeah. here <laughs> on how you have the role you have now. Right. All right, keep going. So, so anyway, so um, because of that, this one project for hypersonics, um, we've I've seen them go from running on only 2,000 nodes on eight Frontera. They've been able to scale up and do problems I dreamed about 25, 30 years ago Ooh, when I was a chills. graduate student. Ooh. And it's like, yeah, the way that you can solve the, the, the and analyze the problems now and and is just amazing and and the fact that they can process and, and do models that we just had never dreamed about way back <laughs> when when I was doing my degree. It's a long time ago, but, <laughs> but still. Just a couple weeks ago. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> anyway, that, that project I think is great. But even so, you know, yeah. we got all kinds of design, you know, national hazard yeah. support, uh, you know, storm, storm surge modeling, yeah. hurricane modeling. I love all those projects. Yeah, I, they always work. have something interesting from my point of view, so I, mean, I like supporting them all. The but. work that, that you and the researchers do around you can quite possibly save our lives or at mm -hmm. least extend them, mm -hmm. and we are extremely grateful for that. Tommy, you are an absolutely stellar guest. <laughs> thank you so much for being here, for all that you do at TAC. John Furrier, thank you so much for creating this company so we could be sitting on this stage having this discourse. We're Lisa, fabulous as always, thank you for your <laughs> insights. And thank all of you at home for tuning in to theCUBE here in Denver. My name's Savannah Peterson. We'll see you for our final two segments next.